Okay, th thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this next bit comes at things in a slightly different way because what I did was to imagine that somebody had come to me and said, um, I want to do a conversion or I want to do a cross-border division. And I had had to sit down and think about, well, if I was the person advising them on wanting to do this, how would I think about it? Or if I were the company that wanted to do it? Um, so I'm going to come at it from a very practical point of view, um, which I hope will give you another perspective on how to think about this. So if I start off with the uh, new provisions on how to convert a company, um, what are the questions that I think you should be asking at the beginning? Um, so the company that wants to use this new procedure, um, where is that company incorporated at the moment? And which member state does it want to move to? Um, and then obviously, uh, once we have the directive in force, your next question will be, well, have those member states implemented the directive yet? And I think we've heard already today uh, that there may be some challenges that member states see in implementing the directives. Um, but even assuming that they've, they've got to that, generally my practical experience has been in the past that it takes different member states um, a certain amount of time to actually implement the directives and obviously you are dependent on member states having um, transposed the directive into their own national legislation. But assuming that they have um, for the time being, the next thing to think about is, is the sort of company that wants to perform this conversion covered by the directive? And this is one of the areas where the directive is less expansive than the case law. Um, so there may still be cases where you would want to rely on the case law and the freedom of establishment under the treaty because the directive covers limited liability companies that are formed in a member state and have either their registered office or their central administration or their principal place of business in the EU. So you have to come into one of those categories and there is a list of the types of limited liability companies that are covered in Annex 2 to the directive. Um, so you would look at that. And then obviously in the member state that the company wants to move to, there may be different sorts of limited liability companies that the company could convert into. Uh, so I think already uh, you'll be thinking about contacting a notary or a lawyer or looking for some publicly available information um, as to what those different types of companies are and which is going to be the particular sort of limited liability company that's going to be suitable for your client or your company. Um, it's going to need to have a registered office somewhere, whether that is, um, it might have premises already because it might already have a branch in the country that it wants to move to, or it might be looking for somebody to provide some sort of facility um, that it can use for its registered office. And obviously you'll be thinking about whether the member state that you want to move to, what its company law requirements are. Is it a country which has a real seat requirement? And what does that real seat requirement consist of? Because obviously the requirements differ from one member state to another. Does that member state have any participation requirements for employees? And what are those? At what level do those apply? Um, that obviously is going to make a, a difference to the approach you're going to adopt. We've heard a little bit from Nora about the provisions in the directive to do with um, protection of creditors and protection of shareholders. And it's obviously going to be very important in practice to think about what sorts of creditors does your company have at the moment and what approach do you want to adopt to dealing with those creditors. Now, Obviously, Nora has been focusing on situations where things may go wrong at a later stage, but I think it's important to remember that probably in the vast number of cases, certainly for cross-border mergers that have been done so far, um, they are done and the businesses continue quite successfully for quite a long time afterwards. So, you know, we have to remember that these, these movements from one country to another don't always end in disaster. Um, and 
very often, um, certainly my experience was that businesses want to do the right thing, want to make sure that people are going to be looked after because they know that they're going to have to deal with these people on a continuing basis. You know, their business won't exist if they go around upsetting their creditors at an early stage. So thinking about um, who are the creditors of the company, what sorts of concerns they're likely to have, which of the various approaches that the directive offers you are going to be the right ones for your um, process uh, is important because that will affect the timetable that you're going to use. And similarly for the shareholders, are the shareholders going to be supportive? Well, obviously, if you are a single member company, uh, life is very nice and easy, and it's not difficult to uh, talk to your shareholders. But the larger the number of shareholders that you have, and the greater um, variety there is amongst the shareholders you have, um, the more you have to worry about whether shareholders are going to support your proposal or not, or whether they're likely to want to make uh, take advantage of the provisions for their protection um, because I don't think any company will want to go into the process in circumstances where it's expecting shareholders uh, to want to fight the company as to the proposals that the company is making. I mean, obviously, there will be situations in which a small group of shareholders may, for some reason or another, not be happy with the proposals that are being made. Um, and then the company will want to be confident that whatever it's proposing will stand up to scrutiny in the court if need be. And similarly for employee participation provisions, if those are relevant to your company, um, how is that going to work? What's the process going to be? How long is that going to take? <laughs> and just going back to creditors for a moment, Nora was mentioning this um, thing about a solvency declaration. Uh, what the proposed directive does is to give member states an option as to whether they require there to be a, a solvency declaration or not. So obviously you need to check for your country whether the member state has taken advantage of that option um, and does or doesn't require a solvency declaration. And if it does, uh, you'll have to think about when that's going to be made. It can't be made more than a month before the draft terms are going to be made public. Um, and there could be, depending on the company, quite a lot of work that will need to go into that. The company may feel that it wants to involve its outside auditors um, in giving reassurance to the directors that uh, they are making the right sorts of assumptions and taking the right sorts of things into account, particularly if, as Nora was suggesting, um, you may be facing personal liability or criminal proceedings if you make a declaration when you don't have reasonable grounds for doing so. Again, people have mentioned already that there may be certain situations in which you're not allowed to take advantage of um, the conversion procedure. So if um, proceedings have already started to wind the company up or to put it into liquidation or it's insolvent, or proceedings have started um, for some sort of preventative restructuring, or if the company has suspended its payments on an ongoing basis, or um, if it's a financial institution, uh, that if the national authority has started um, to use the various resolution tools and mechanisms and powers uh, that are available under EU law. Also, um, in certain cases, uh, the law might let the national authority take preventative measures um, in relation to the first two or the third of those. And again, what the directive says, if you're in any of those situations, um, you can't take advantage of the procedure. Um, so for companies that are, that are in financial difficulties, it's fairly unlikely that this process would be used. And then the other thing I think to think about at an early stage is what is your reason for making this transfer? Um, because as we've heard, if the national authority was to conclude that what you were trying to do was to get an undue tax advantage or you were trying to prejudice employee creditor or minority member rights, um, they would have the power to stop you doing that. And actually, I think one of the positive things that might come out of this is that it's more likely to get the directors and management to focus on explaining the reason for the conversion that they want to do. So actually being proactive, because 
from the company's perspective, the more you can put forward a good and convincing reason as to why you're making this proposed transfer. Um, I think the less likely in practice it is that the national authority would come to the conclusion that you were trying to do this for an artificial reason. Um, and I would just say, uh, by way of um, uh, an aside, that governments don't seem to have had much difficulty in the years up to date in um, taking action where they think there is an abuse going on. We've seen that from the cases. Uh, so I think, I certainly don't anticipate that governments will have difficulties in future in continuing to do that in case where, cases where they think um, there is an artificial arrangement going on. And I wonder whether, coming back to what Monica was talking about earlier, whether you couldn't have a system where you allow the national authority leeway rather than saying in a positive way you must find that there's an artificial arrangement if the following things are satisfied. What documents are you going to need to draft? Um, and obviously it will be a matter for discussion between the company and its advisors as to who is going to be mainly responsible for writing these. Um, I think it will probably become the case that advisors uh, will develop almost like a, a template of um, documents that, that at least explain to the company the areas that they have to fill in. But it's always going to have to be the company that comes up with a lot of the basic information. Uh, so on the first one, you will need draft terms um, for your cross-border conversion. And the directive sets out um, some information that you must put into that. Um, if you're, all of your shareholders have agreed that you don't de need that, then you don't have to have a draft terms of cross-border conversion. Um, but this includes things like, what's your constitution going to be in the country that you want to move to? What's your proposed timetable? What safeguards are you offering to your creditors? What's the cash compensation that you're offering to shareholders who object? What effect is this going to have on employment of employees? Uh, if employee participation applies to you, what are the procedures that you're going to follow to involve the employees in this? And um, if the member state does require a solvency declaration, um, the statement that will have to go into the draft terms to say that you don't know of any reason why the company should be unable to meet its liabilities when they fall due after the conversion. And as I say, that, that will come after quite a lot of work. Um, depending on which route you have chosen to protect your creditors, you might want to go for a report from an independent expert um, to say that the expert's view is that creditors aren't going to be prejudiced by the company moving from one country to another. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that your company is going to need a new constitution in the country that it's going to. And there are two more reports that the management or administrative organ has to draw up, one for the shareholders and one for the employees. And in both cases, again, what the directive does is to set out in quite a lot of detail um, the sorts of information that have to go into this, which I think will be helpful again, um, particularly in relation to the anti-abuse. So for example, um, you have to explain what the legal and economic aspects of the conversion will be um, and justify those. You have to give information about what the implications of the move will be for the company's future business and the strategic plan that the management has. Um, what difference is it going to make to the shareholders? So you'll have to understand the differences in the law that applies to shareholders where you are and the law that applies to shareholders in the country that you're moving to. Um, information about the remedies for shareholders who want to oppose, things like that. Um, and then as far as employees are concerned, you have to explain um, what the implications are going to be for safeguarding employment relationships and any material changes that there will be. So I think all this, this required content information means that shareholders and employees and creditors should be pretty well informed um, by these documents as to what the effect is going to be on the company.
In addition to that, you're going to have to draft the notice of the general meeting for the shareholders to approve the conversion. Um, there will be some form of application that you'll have to make to the relevant authority in the country where you are to get your pre-conversion certificate to say that you've met all the requirements in your existing country. And you'll also be applying in the member state that you want to move to um, for them uh, to also say that you've met the relevant requirements for that. In my experience, companies are always very interested in how long this is going to take. Um, so, and they always want to do it as quickly as possible. So I thought it would be quite helpful to set out what I think is the minimum timetable that you would have to follow um, for all of this. And I probably should say by way of background that just to get to the stage, my very first step, which is when you make your report to the shareholders and your report to the employees available to them, you're going to have to have done a lot of work in advance of that um, to, to get all that information together that I've just been talking about. Um, that information, the report to the members and the report to employees, has to be available at least two months before the general meeting, and that's obviously to allow shareholders and employees enough time uh, to digest that information. And at that stage as well, if you've decided that you want to use an independent expert as a way of demonstrating that your creditors aren't going to be prejudiced, um, you would be appointing that person at that time as well. The other thing which you might not immediately spot when you read the draft directive is that it might be a good idea from the time that you publish um, these two reports to start telling anyone that you're entering into a contract with or anyone who's a counterparty to any transaction that you are doing about this cross-border conversion proposal and also to tell them where you are proposing to move your registered office um, because what um, the draft directive says is that you will be liable for any losses um, that arise from any differences in the legal systems uh, once your company has moved to the new country unless you have warned people. And because I think most companies won't want to be liable, um, I think they should be warning people um, as soon as it becomes public knowledge that this is what the company is proposing to do. And similarly, uh, the draft directive says that people can rely on your existing registered office um, unless the company can prove that the person knew or ought to have known where the registered office was going to be in the country that you're moving to. So if you start putting things onto your emails and um, letterhead and invoices and stuff like that um, as a warning that you are proposing to convert and saying where your registered office is going to move to, um, again, it would be, I think, relatively easy to show as a company that um, people should have known that that was the case. If you are going to um, apply uh, to appoint an independent expert, what the directive says is that um, that independent expert has to be appointed within five working days. I think this is another area where member states might have to give some thought to how is this going to work in practice. From the company's point of view, they will be very keen um, to know who can act as an independent expert, who will be acceptable to the national authority um, as being independent and the directive does have some requirements on that. Um, and from the company's point of view, uh, they will want a system that works uh, quickly and efficiently. And from the, from the member states' point of view as well, if, if there has to be uh, only five working days from when the company applies to appoint the expert to when the expert is appointed, um, that, that suggests that you have to have a system up and running that's going to work well in practice. Um, at least a month before the general meeting, the relevant documents have to be disclosed in the register, uh, which means that they will be publicly available. Companies um, can alternatively put them on their website as long as they are available free of charge. Um, but even if they adopt that approach, the directive still says that there's certain information that you have to give the register. Um, so companies may just think it's easier to put all the information into the register in the first place. And uh, what the directive also says is that it's a month after those documents are made publicly available in the register that 
that's the last date if a creditor wants to apply for a safeguard. And one of the benefits of that um, is that it means that before you get to the general meeting, you should know whether any of the creditors are proposing to apply for safeguards. And I think that will be quite an important bit of information for shareholders in deciding whether to approve things or not. The date of the general meeting is also the last time at which shareholders, creditors and employees can submit comments on the proposed conversion, both to the company and to the competent authority in your existing country. And again, that's a good practical approach because it again means that by the time the shareholders vote, they should know uh, whether there are likely to be any problems or not. From the company's point of view, assuming that your shareholders vote in favour, um, you will want to tell the competent authority what decision the general meeting came to as soon as possible, because again, that's a, a relevant bit of information and affects the timetable that comes afterwards. Um, and also, you will want to submit the terms of conversion that have been approved to the competent authority in the new member state. Shareholders have up until a month after the date of the general meeting um, to accept the cash compensation that's being offered to them. And a month after the general meeting is also uh, the last date for the competent authority to come to its preliminary assessment as to whether uh, the application for the pre-conversion certificate is going to be granted or not. And it's two months after the general meeting, which is the last date when shareholders can apply to court um, to recalculate the cash compensation. Now, that might be a bit of a worry to companies because uh, they will have done all their planning um, on an assumption that uh, shareholders will accept what the company is offering. So they might want uh, advice as to whether they should be putting something into the resolution that shareholders are asked to approve just in case um, shareholders do want to apply to court and ask the court to recalculate the cash compensation. If the, if the relevant authority in your existing country does decide that they have some concerns about whether this is an artificial arrangement or not, um, they have up, up until three months after the date of the general meeting uh, to decide whether to give the pre-conversion certificate. Um, so you would hope that you would get a favourable response on that, um, but you would have to wait and see in those cases where there is an in-depth assessment. Um, I would have thought that in-depth assessments would be relatively unusual in the same way as if you have a competition concern on a transaction. Um, in most cases, people can sort that out by discussion with the relevant authority, and it's only in relatively unusual cases uh, that you get an in-depth um, competition authority assessment of your transaction. The conversion will take effect once uh, the pre-conversion certificate has been issued and the member state that you want to move to has looked at your application to convert and said, yes, you meet the relevant requirements. Um, and assuming that conversion takes place, then the company will have to meet any requirements that there are either in your existing country or your new country um, to disclose the fact that the conversion has now completed. And you have up until a month after the conversion actually taking effect to pay the cash compensation to shareholders. So you can see that that's the quickest you can do your conversion process. So there is quite a lot of time um, involved in going through the conversion. Um, and I think the time is partly there to make sure that shareholders, creditors and employees have a proper opportunity and the relevant authorities in the member states um, to look at the various uh, things that are going on and the information that the company has provided. And remember, as I said to you, that's, that's the quickest that you would be able to do it. Um, so if you haven't got yourself well organized, um, it could take you longer. <laughs> 
We haven't talked very much about cross-border divisions, but I have to say that I think this is going to be one of the really good new areas. Um, I can remember when cross-border murders were introduced as a directive that people were quite unsure as to whether people would take advantage of cross-border murders or not. And it has proved to be a really successful um, mechanism for businesses to restructure. Um, and I think we will see the same with cross-border divisions. I think, although it's possible to find other ways in which you can achieve a similar effect at the moment, as we've heard, the lack of processes, the lack of um, an established framework has been a problem for companies. And I think the fact that member states will have a common procedure for doing this will be very helpful. And I thought what I would do is, rather than sort of go through exactly all the same things in detail, I'd try and pick out for you what are the things that are different about cross-border divisions. Um, there are some similarities, so things like uh, what sort of a company is it that wants to do this division, and again, it has to be a limited liability company formed in a member state, and it has to have its registered office central administration or principal place of business in the EU. Um, one of the important things is that you have to check that two of the companies that are involved in the division will be governed by the laws of different member states. Um, so you're going to have to look at which companies are going to exist after the division has taken place. And again, think about whether the relevant member states have implemented the directive. And again, you're going to have to think about what sort of company um, is the company in the new member state going to be? Um, and where is its registered office going to be? And what are the requirements there? And so there are um, quite a lot of similar questions to ask as in the case of a conversion. One additional thing to think about, which isn't relevant for conversions, is does the company that wants to divide, does it hold its own shares? Or is there some third party that holds shares for the company? Um, because the recipient companies, the companies that under the division are going to receive assets and liabilities, are not allowed to issue their shares in exchange for those shares that are held in Treasury. One thing to note about the, the division procedure is, for the moment, what the directive does is limit it to situations where the companies that are going to receive either all the assets or some of the assets and liabilities must be newly formed companies. So you can't, at the moment under this proposed directive, do a division to an existing company. I think uh, that the reason for that may have been that it's much more complicated when you're trying to do a division of all or part of the assets to an existing company. Um, and it's much simpler if you're doing a division to a newly formed company. I would hope that assuming that this um, directive is a success, that in due course, in the same way as the Commission went back to the cross-border mergers directive, when they saw that it was being successful but that, but that it could be improved, when it does its review, um, assuming that this is successful too, that it would be willing to go back and see whether divisions could be extended to situations where you're doing the division to an existing company. Um, there's a choice for member states as to how much cash consideration um, is offered by the receiving companies. Um, they have a choice as to whether to limit the cash consideration to 10% of the nominal value of the shares or securities, um, or whether to allow a larger cash consideration than that. So obviously you'll need to check for each member state as to which, um, whether that's the case or not. Um, and as I said, two of the companies have to be in different member states. The documents that you're going to need are very similar to um, the documents that you need to do a conversion, but there are some additional content requirements. So things like what ratio is going to apply for the exchange of shares in the dividing company? Um, what are the terms of allotment of the shares um, in the recipient company? Are there any special advantages that are going to be granted to the experts. Very importantly, uh, what the directive says is that you have to describe precisely what assets and liabilities the recipient companies are going to get. And if you've got more than one company that's receiving assets and liabilities, 
how are those assets and liabilities going to be allocated between them? Um, the other thing is that uh, the Commission has been very good in thinking about all the things that might go wrong in advance, and it's thought of the case where uh, you have, haven't identified either an asset or a liability, and you have to say how that will be dealt with um, if you know, some asset appears at a later stage or, more worryingly, a liability appears at a later stage that um, you haven't explicitly allocated. Um, you have to explain how you've evaluated your assets and liabilities um, and how you've worked out uh, how to allocate shares and what criteria you've used for that. And there are some additional content requirements for the report to the shareholders, in particular um, an explanation of how you came up with your share exchange ratio that you're proposing. Going back to this question of whether you might have assets or liabilities that haven't been allocated, the draft directive actually provides a default rule that will apply um, if you haven't dealt with that. Um, and what the default rule says is that anything that hasn't been allocated will be allocated to the recipient companies in proportion to the share of the net assets uh, that they got under the draft terms. Um, if you're doing a partial division, so not all of the assets and liabilities are being divided, uh, then it'll be on the basis of what went to the recipient companies and what stayed with the company that's being divided. Now, that may or may not actually fit with the way that the company wants to divide up its assets and liabilities. And so it would be much better, I think, to, for the terms actually to deal with that in practice rather than leaving it to the default rule. The independent expert who has to make this examination of all the information and a recommendation to the national authority who has to decide whether there's an artificial arrangement or not, as well as assessing the reports in the same way as they would do if there was a conversion going on, also has to think about um, some additional things. So it has to, the expert has to say what methods have been used to work out what the share ratio is and say if those are adequate or not um, and calculate the values and say uh, which of the various methods that have been used, how, which one is more important than the other. And importantly, the independent expert has to say whether the ratio that's being used is a fair and reasonable one. And again, I think the fact that the independent expert has this role is likely to encourage the company and its advisors uh, to do everything they can to make sure that the independent expert comes to the conclusion that what they are proposing is fair and reasonable. I'm not going to say anything on um, the draft timetable, but broadly uh, the parameters, so the, the timings at which you have to produce things when you hold your general meeting and the protections for creditors and shareholders are the same as they would be for a transfer of seat. Um, it's possible that you might have a problem it, where you're doing a cross-border division to two or more member states. Um, and what would the case be if one member state were to say, yes, we approve the division, but another member state were to say, no, we don't? Um, and also, what if the member states take different times to come to their conclusions? Um, what the directive says is that they have to issue a decision as soon as they've completed their assessment of the relevant conditions, um, but it may be that in one member state things are more complicated than in another. Uh, so you get one member state saying, yes, we're happy with the division as far as we're concerned, but you have to wait longer. Um, what the directive says is that the division can't take effect um, until you've received all of the notifications from all of the member states, and uh, it's for the law of the country where your company exists at the moment to determine when the division takes effect. Um, all I would say is that I think if I were the advisor, I would be thinking about maybe putting a condition into the resolution that shareholders are going to approve um, to say that this division will only go ahead if all of the member states have approved the division because you wouldn't want to find yourself in a difficult situation where for some reason one country had said yes but another country had said no and then you were slightly unsure as to what the legal effect of that was. Uh, the draft directive also deals with 
um, any special formalities and um, in some member states you might find that they require you to complete these special formalities before a transfer of a particular asset or a right or an obligation becomes effective um, and you should be thinking as an advisor what sort of um, which of the various companies is going to be responsible for doing that. The directive also says something about what accounting dates um, the companies will be able to use after the cross-border division takes effect. And you will have to set out in your draft terms uh, what the position is going to be. Again, what the directive does is to set out a default position, which is that if you say nothing, uh, the date that will be used for accounting purposes is the date that the division takes effect. Now, I, I know from studies that were done for the Commission in relation to cross-border mergers um, that problems have arisen in the past where different national laws have meant that there have been different approaches as to what's the right accounting date. Um, what this directive does is to give you some flexibility, so you could put something into your draft terms um, to say what you want your accounting date to be as the date from which... Uh, for the new company, transactions undertaken will be treated as being transactions of the new company. But they've also put some limits on it, which I think is quite helpful too. So you can't choose a date that's earlier than the last balance sheet date um, used by the existing company. And it can't be earlier than the date on which the new companies were formed. And you have to have satisfied yourself that all of the companies that will exist after the division has taken place will be able to meet their requirements under the relevant laws to, to draw up financial statements after the division takes effect. So that seems to me to be quite a good balance between giving some flexibility to the companies concerned but trying to make sure that they meet the legal requirements that apply to them. Finally, the other thing I think is really good about this proposed directive is that there is a requirement for the Commission to evaluate and report on how it's working in five years' time um, and that they will have to give data as to how many conversions and divisions there have been um, and information about the related costs that go with them. So if you are involved in any of these, it would be good to um, keep notes, particularly on the cost, because the Commission is always very interested in what the costs are and whether you know, we really are managing to make it better for business um, to do these things by having these rules in place. Um, and they will have to do a report on the feasibility of having rules for a broader group of cross-border divisions. And if you come across problems um, or examples where it would have been really helpful if the directive had done something else, it would be very helpful to keep a note of those too. Uh, because I think when the Commission has been presented in the past with evidence of practical problems, for example, in relation to the cross-border mergers directive, um, they've been very willing to listen to that. Um, and uh, as we've seen in the company law package, to do things which then deal uh, with those difficulties. So I hope that's given you a sort of slightly different um, view of how you might think about this and how it might work in practice. Um, I have to say I'm really excited about the prospect of um, companies being able to take advantage of these provisions. And I think in the same way as the cross-border mergers directive has been a really useful tool for businesses in the EU, um, that the, cross, the conversion process and the cross-border divisions uh, will be the same. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have.